Caldecott Tunnel is a four-bore highway tunnel through the Berkeley Hills between Oakland, California and Orinda, California. The East-West Tunnel is signed as part of State Route 24 and connects Oakland to Central Contra Costa County and is named after Thomas E. Caldecott, Mayor of Berkeley from 1930-32 to and President of Joint Highway District 13, which built the first two bores. In the fall of 2013, workers employed by the construction firm Tudor Saliba had nearly completed work on the Caldecott Tunnel in Northern California. Part of the funding for the project came from the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, ARRA, which attempted to increase aggregate demand during the recession of 2007 to 2009. The American Recovery and Reinvestment Act that I will sign today, a plan that meets the principles I laid out in January, is the most sweeping economic recovery package in our history. It's the product of broad consultation and the recipient of broad support from business leaders, unions, public interest groups, from the Chamber of Commerce and the National Association of Manufacturers, as well as the AFL-CIO from Democrats and Republicans, mayors as well as governors. It's a rare thing in Washington for people with such diverse and different viewpoints to come together and support the same bill. And what makes this recovery plan so important is not just that it will create or save three and a half million jobs over the next two years, including 60,000 plus here in Colorado. It's that we're putting Americans to work doing the work that America needs done. Work that will bring real and lasting change for generations to come. Because we know we can't build our economic future on the transportation and information networks of the past. We are remaking the American landscape with the largest new investment in our nation's infrastructure since Eisenhower built an interstate highway system in the 1950s. As contractor Tudor Saliba mobilizes to the construction site, those who led the fight for a fourth bore of the Caldecott Tunnel on Highway 24 in Oakland, California, celebrate the start of construction. This has been a long, long time coming. Tudor Saliba was awarded the contract with a bid of $215 million, some 20% below the engineer's estimate. We are in the process of mobilizing. We're establishing site offices, and we're hoping to start the physical work in the next week or two. Edward Chamara, project manager for the contractor, says they will excavate the 1,033-meter-long by 12-and-a-half-meter wide two-lane road tunnel from both ends. Tudor Saliba is doing the east heading. Our subcontractor, Foxfire, he's coming from the other side and he has his own equipment. Tudor Saliba has purchased a Verth T3.20 road header like this one for the east heading, the largest road header to be used in the United States to date. Looking at the western portals, the new bore will be constructed to the left of your screen, next to the third bore using Natum excavation, in challenging ground conditions comprised mostly of weathered material with mixed faces. Our design provides uh, four major uh, support categories. Uh, some of them are subdivided in class A, class A and B, and uh, we will primarily be in class two, two and three. At the beginning, at the portal section, we will be in class four as well. We will be uh, supporting this first section with pipe canopies, uh, just to get through some very weak areas at the beginning with low overburden. The project is similar to the Devil Slide Tunnel, roughly an hour's drive away on the coast just south of San Francisco. Excavation on that project is roughly 60% complete. The two projects are both road tunnels for Caltrans. They are both Natum excavations in similar ground conditions, and both potentially gassy tunnels. But unlike Devil Slide, the fourth bore of the Caldecott Tunnel poses an added challenge. We've been isolated out of Devil Slide at a, at a location with no one around. This we do have residents living right at the west end of the tunnel as well as above the east end of the tunnel. This $420 million project had difficulty getting funding until it received $197 million from President Obama's American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. It is the single largest allocation of stimulus funding for a single project so far in the nation. And without that money, this project would be stalled because we couldn't sell bonds. And so it was a shot in the arm to help expedite this project. It's now up to Tuta Saliba to deliver the project. I think they're a competent contractor. 
I think they'll their means and methods will dictate their schedule, but I think they're I'm talking to the team, they're confident they can meet that schedule. An excavation schedule that will be completed sometime in 2013. <laughs> with the celebrated opening of a fourth bore of this notoriously congested stretch of highway in 2014. The ARRA is an example of discretionary fiscal policy. To carry out the Caldecott project, Tudor Saliba hired an additional 106 workers. A majority of the economists believe that a temporary increase in government spending can lead to increased employment during a recession. But some economists argue that government spending shifts employment from one group of workers to another but it does not increase total employment. The argument over the effect of government spending on employment continues years after the end of the 2007 to 2009 recession. This morning, President Trump tweeted this. Consumer confidence is at a 16-year high, and for good reason. Much more regulation busting to come, working hard for tax cuts and reform. He's preaching the message of economic optimism. He has to, because the media will not. Across the financial world, the evidence is clear. Things are looking up. The media ignores it. Umpteen stock market records. And the Dow is up, what, 4,000 points since the election? And that has added over $4 trillion to the nation's wealth. Have you seen that widely reported? No, you have not. Economic growth, it's really picking up. A 2.6% annual rate between April and June nearly double the rate from January to March. Let's not forget Foxconn's $10 billion investment in Wisconsin, 13,000 jobs. Amazon hires 20,000 workers in a day. There's a line around the block to sign up. Today, Toyota announces a $1.6 billion car plant to be built in America. And that jobs report? 209,000 new jobs last month. That is, by any measure, a solid performance. America becomes the dominant energy power in the world. That's a plus. You don't hear about it. That is astonishing. Most people don't know this. They have not been told. The media is obsessing over things that have little to do with their everyday lives. In fact, the establishment media has become the resistance party. They are the not-so-loyal opposition. Can you believe the Washington Post publishes the president's phone calls with foreign leaders? On this program, we concentrate on what matters to you, not the disgraceful antics of a hateful media which still hasn't recovered from Hillary's loss. So let's say it again. Our politics have been corrupted by hate, and the hate is coming from the left. But our money's doing well. And things are looking up because we are finally breaking out of the all-government, all-the-time stalemate of the last eight years. State and local governments sometimes change their taxing and spending policies to aid their local economies. But these are not fiscal policy actions because they are not intended to affect the national economy. Some of the decisions the federal government makes about taxes and spending are not fiscal policy actions because they are not intended to achieve macroeconomic policy goals. Automatic stabilizers are government spending and taxes that automatically increase or decrease along with the business cycle. Changes in these types of spending and taxes happen without policy actions by the government. For example, when the economy is expanding and employment is increasing, government spending on unemployment insurance payments to workers who have lost their jobs will automatically decrease. With discretionary fiscal policy, the government takes actions to change spending or taxes. Until the Great Depression of the 1930s, the majority of government spending in the United States occurred at the state and local levels. Since World War II, the federal government's share of total government expenditures has been between two-thirds and three-quarters. As a fraction of GDP, the federal government's purchases of goods and services have been declining since the Korean War in the early 1950s. 
Total expenditures by the federal government, including transfer payments, as a fraction of GDP, slowly rose from 1950 through the early 1990s and fell from 1992 to 2001, before rising yet again. The recession of 2007 to 2009 and the slow recovery that followed led to a surge in federal government expenditures, causing them to raise to their highest level as a percentage of GDP since World War II. Federal government purchases can be divided into defense spending, which makes up about 21.7% of the federal budget, and spending on everything else the federal government does, from paying the salaries of FBI agents to operating the national parks, to supporting scientific research, which makes up about 8.2% of the budget. In addition to purchases, there are three other categories of federal government expenditures interest on the national debt, grants to state and local governments, and transfer payments. Transfer payments rose from 25% of the federal government expenditures in the 1960s to 46.4% in 2012. In 2012, individual income taxes raised 42.7% of the federal government's revenues. Corporate income taxes raised 13.9% of revenue. Payroll taxes to fund the Social Security and Medicare programs raised 35% of revenue. The remaining 8.5% of revenues were raised from excise taxes, tariffs on imports, and other sources. Keep in mind that the Social Security and Medicare programs are funded equally between employers and employees each contributing about 7.5% of the employee's annual salary. The Christian Science Monitor examined how some experts have raised concerns that Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security might represent a fiscal time bomb for the U.S. For example, recent reductions to Medicare spending approved by Congress are a drop in the bucket compared with the cost of new prescription drug benefits, and program trustees have estimated that the Medicare Trust Fund will become insolvent by 2020, as reported by the Monitor. In addition, the Congressional Budget Office has estimated that Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and interest on the national debt could account for half of the U.S. gross domestic product by 2050. According to the Monitor, the nub of the challenge is the confluence of the three long-term trends. One, people are living longer. Two, health care costs keep rising. And three, the government has promised to pay much of the tab for retirees. Kent Smetters, a professor of risk management at the University of Pennsylvania, and Jagadish Kolokale, of the Cato Institute estimated the current fiscal imbalance of the federal government based on all the estimated future spending and income at about $65 trillion. They added that Medicare and Social Security taxes would have to double immediately to eliminate the deficit. However, according to the Monitor, forecasting is an inexact science, and many factors, such as birth rates and health of seniors, will influence the fiscal situation over the coming decades. In the post-war world, after World War II, every country in the West has had a full employment policy, which means that not that we've had full employment. On the contrary, as you know, we've been having increasing unemployment in recent years. But that every time, for quite a period, there was a threat of unemployment or unemployment started to rise, there was a strong tendency by government to say, we've got to do something about this. We have to print more money. We have to spend more money. We have to stimulate the economy. The result of which has been to create an increased quantity of money that in the first instance has had some favorable effects on employment but only temporarily, only so long as you could fool the people. And then, when people got on to what was going on, it came out in the form of inflation. In the United States, we've also had 
or for, and in most countries. A third, less important factor that has contributed to excessive increases in the quantity of money, and that has been mistaken policies by the central bank. Professor Segan referred to the mistake of the Federal Reserve Bank in the 19, late 20s, early 30s. From 1929 to 1933, the quantity of money in the United States went down by a third, and that was a major factor that produced the catastrophe. That was a great mistake of the Federal Reserve. It learned from that mistake. Government agencies like people don't always make the same mistake the next time, they make a different one. And since that period, the central banks have tended to make the mistake in the opposite direction. Their mistake has almost always been caused by confusing their function, by thinking that they had something to do with interest rates instead of recognizing that their real function was to control the quantity of money. The federal government uses macroeconomic policies to offset the effects of the business cycle on the economy. When the economy is in recession, increases in government purchases or decreases in taxes increase aggregate demand. Decreasing government purchases or raising taxes slows the growth of aggregate demand and reduces the inflation rate. The core of expansionary fiscal policy involves increasing government purchases or decreasing taxes. An increase in government purchases will increase aggregate demand directly. A cut in taxes has an indirect effect on aggregate demand. Cutting the individual income tax will increase household disposable income and consumption spending. Cutting taxes on business income can increase aggregate demand by increasing business investment. The goal of both expansionary monetary policy and expansionary fiscal policy is to increase aggregate demand relative to what it would have been without the policy. In panel A, short-run equilibrium is at point A, with real GDP of $17.2 trillion and a price level of 108. Real GDP is below potential GDP. So, the economy is in a recession. An expansionary fiscal policy will cause aggregate demand to shift to the right from 81 to 82, increasing real GDP from $17.2 trillion to $17.4 trillion, and a price level from 108 to 110, moving to point B. Contractionary fiscal policy involves decreasing government purchases or increasing taxes. Policymakers use contractionary fiscal policy to reduce increases in aggregate demand that seem likely to lead to inflation. In panel B, the economy begins at point A with real GDP at $17.6 trillion and a price level at 112. Because real GDP is greater than potential GDP, the economy will experience rising wages and prices. A contractionary fiscal policy will cause aggregate demand to shift to the left from 81 to 82, decreasing real GDP from $17.6 trillion to $17.4 trillion, and the price level moving from 112 to 110 at point B. The impact of fiscal policy assumes that monetary policy and all other factors affecting the variables involved are held constant, ceteris paribus. A contractionary fiscal policy does not cause the price level to fall. A contractionary fiscal policy causes the price level to rise less than it would have risen without the policy. Procyclical and countercyclical are terms used to describe how an economic quantity is related to economic fluctuations. Their meanings may vary with regard to business cycle theory and economic policy making. The terms are often used loosely to describe a government's approach to spending and taxation. A procyclical fiscal policy can be summarized simply as governments choosing to increase public spending and reduce taxes during an economic boom.
but reduce spending and increase taxes during a recession. A countercyclical fiscal policy refers to the opposite approach reducing spending and raising taxes during a boom period, and increasing spending and cutting taxes during a recession. In Chapter 24, we developed a dynamic aggregate demand and aggregate supply model to account for two important facts. One, the economy experiences continuing inflation with the price level rising every year. And two, the economy experiences long-run growth with the long-run aggregate supply curve shifting to the right every year. The factors that cause the long-run aggregate supply curve to shift also cause firms to supply more goods and services at any given price level in the short run which is shown by shifting the short-run aggregate supply curve to the right. During most years, the aggregate demand curve shifts to the right, indicating that aggregate expenditure is higher at every price level. The goal of both expansionary monetary policy and expansionary fiscal policy is to increase aggregate demand relative to what it would have been without the policy. Contractionary fiscal policy involves decreasing government purchases or increasing taxes. Policymakers use contractionary fiscal policy to reduce increases in aggregate demand that seem likely to lead to inflation. Equilibrium is initially at point A, with real GDP equal to potential GDP of $17 trillion and the price level equal to 110. Without an expansionary policy, aggregate demand will shift from AD1 to AD2 without policy, which is not enough to keep real GDP equal to potential GDP because long-run aggregate supply has shifted from LRAS1 to LRAS2. The new short-run equilibrium is at point B, with real GDP of $17.3 trillion and a price level of 113. Increasing government purchases or cutting taxes will shift aggregate demand to AD2 with policy. Equilibrium will be at point C with real GDP of $17.4 trillion, which is its potential level, and a price level of 115. The price level is higher than it would have been without an expansionary fiscal policy. Equilibrium is initially at point A, with real GDP equal to potential GDP of $17 trillion and a price level equal to 110. Without a contractionary policy, aggregate demand will shift from AD1 to AD2 without policy, which results in short-run equilibrium at point B, with real GDP of $17.5 trillion which is greater than potential GDP and a price level of 115. Decreasing government purchases or increasing taxes can shift aggregate demand to AD2 with policy. Equilibrium will be at point C with real GDP of $17.4 trillion, which is its potential level and a price level of 113. The inflation rate will be 2.7%, as opposed to the 4.5% it would have been without the contractionary fiscal policy. An initial increase in government purchases of $100 billion causes the aggregate demand curve to shift to the right from AD1 to the dashed AD curve and represents the effect of the initial increase of $100 billion in government purchases. Because this initial increase raises incomes and leads to further increases in consumption spending, the aggregate demand curve will ultimately shift further to the right, to AD2. Following an initial increase in government purchases, Spending and real GDP increase over a number of periods due to the multiplier effect. The new spending and increased real GDP in each period is shown in orange, 
and the level of spending from the previous period is shown in blue. The sum of the blue and orange areas represents the cumulative increase in spending and real GDP. In total, equilibrium real GDP will increase by $200 billion as a result of the initial increase of $100 billion in government purchases. If the federal government decides to use discretionary fiscal policy to increase aggregate demand by, for example, spending $100 billion on expanding the Caldecott Tunnel and similar projects, the initial increase in aggregate demand should lead to additional increases in income and spending. Economists refer to the initial increase in government purchases as autonomous because it is not directly caused by changes in the level of real GDP. The increases in consumption spending that result from the initial increase in autonomous expenditures are induced. The multiplier effect is the series of induced increases in consumption spending resulting from an initial increase in autonomous expenditures. The ratio of the change in equilibrium real GDP to the initial change in government purchases is known as the government purchase multiplier. It is the government purchase multiplier equal to the change in equilibrium real GDP divided by the change in government purchases. Tax cuts also have a multiplier effect because they increase the disposable income of households. The expression for the tax multiplier is tax multiplier equals change in equilibrium real GDP divided by the change in taxes. The tax multiplier is a negative number because changes in taxes and changes in real GDP move in opposite directions. A cut in tax rates has a more complicated effect on equilibrium real GDP than does a tax cut of a fixed amount. The higher the tax rate, the smaller the amount of any increase in income that households have available to spend, and the smaller the multiplier effect. A cut in tax rates affects equilibrium real GDP through two channels. One, a cut in tax rates increases the disposable income of households which leads them to increase their consumption spending. And two, a cut in the tax rate increases the size of the multiplier effect. We know that when the AD curve shifts to the right, the price level will rise. The actual change in real GDP resulting from an increase in government purchases or a cut in taxes will be less than that indicated by the simple multiplier with a constant price level. Short-run equilibrium is initially at point A. An increase in government purchases causes the aggregate demand curve to shift to the right, from AD1 to the dashed AD curve. The multiplier effect results in the aggregate demand curve shifting further to the right, to AD2, point B. Because of the upward-sloping supply curve, the shift in the aggregate demand results in a higher price level. In the new equilibrium at point C, both real GDP and the price level have increased. The increase in real GDP is less than that indicated by the multiplier effect with a constant price level. Increases in government purchases and cuts in taxes have a positive multiplier effect on equilibrium real GDP. Decreases in government purchases and increases in taxes also have a multiplier effect on equilibrium real GDP, but in this case, the effect is negative. I can tell you a hundred ways to create unemployment that will produce more inflation, not less. I may say that used to be a proposition that people found it difficult to understand. But the experience of the past 10 years or so has done a great deal to make people understand that it's perfectly possible to have unemployment and inflation go along simultaneously. In fact, we've coined some ugly new words like stagflation and slumpflation to try to explain this phenomenon. Well, I shouldn't say to explain it, to name it. 
So unemployment is not a cure for inflation, but it is an I almost inevitable side effect of an effective cure. Now, why should that be? Why is it that there seems to be no way to cure inflation without going through at least a temporary period of relatively slow growth and relatively high unemployment? The answer is, fundamentally, because of the time delays between the turning of the printing press and the ultimate effects on output and on prices. Both ways you produce the same result. Look on the upgrade. Suppose the government first prints money and spends it to pay for its expenses. To begin with, the people who find themselves doing better business don't know, what's, don't know what the explanation is. Government is paying more money. Its employees have better salaries. They're coming to the store and buying more goods. The storekeeper is delighted to sell them at the same prices as before. Each man thinks this is something special happening to him. The shoe manufacturer says, ah, look, I can sell more shoes. The demand for shoes is going up. He doesn't recognize that what's really happening is the demand is going up everywhere. And then not only is the demand for shoes going up, but he's going to have to pay more to get labor. He's going to have to get, pay more to get leather. He's going to have to pay more to produce his product. But when that shows up, when after a while he finds out that his costs are up, then he suddenly discovers that he has to raise his prices to make both ends meet. And that's why, on the average in the United States over the past hundred years, an increase in the quantity of money has taken about five or six months to affect people's spending. The first thing that happened is people just have bigger bank accounts. Then it takes them a little while to realize that, and they start spending it. And then it's another 12 to 18 months before that works through into prices. So on the average, over the past 100 years, there's, and in the Britain, it's been for 200 years. I say 100 years because that's as far back as our data go in the United States. There's been about a two-year interval between a more rapid increase in the quantity of money on the one hand and the inflationary effects of it on the other. But the same thing happens the other way. If the government slows down its spending, in the first instance, people simply experiencing, experience that as slower demand for their products, and they tr tend to retrench. They tend to say, well, my inventories are going up. I better cut back production. It's only after a considerable interval that that's reflected in lower prices or in a slower rate of increase in prices and works its way through. So there is no way that I know to avoid the interim effect of slowing down inflation. In the long run, there is no relation between inflation and unemployment, on the average. Poorly timed fiscal policy, like poorly timed monetary policy, can do more harm than good. Getting the timing right can be more difficult for fiscal policy. Control over monetary policy is concentrated in the hands of the Federal Open Market Committee. The president and a majority of the 535 members of Congress have to agree on a change in fiscal policy. Even after a fiscal policy decision has been approved, it takes time to implement the policy. Delays may push spending beyond the end of a recession that the spending was supposed to fight. Using government purchases to increase aggregate demand poses another problem. The size of the multiplier effect may be limited if the increase in government purchases causes consumption, investment, or net exports to fall. Crowding out is a decline in the private expenditures as a result of an increase in government purchases. The greater the sensitivity of consumption, investment, and net exports to changes in interest rates, the more crowding out will occur. In a deep recession, many firms may be so pessimistic about the future and have so much excess capacity 
that investment spending falls to very low levels. In this case, crowding out is unlikely to be a problem. If the economy is close to potential GDP, however, and firms are optimistic about the future, an increase in the interest rate may result in a significant decline in investment spending. An increase in government purchases will increase the demand for money from money demand 1 to money demand 2 as real GDP and income rise. With the supply of money constant at $950 billion, the result is an increase in the equilibrium interest rate from 3 to 5%, which crowds out some consumption, investment, and net exports. Equilibrium is initially at point A, with real GDP of $17.2 trillion below potential GDP. So the economy is in a recession. In the absence of crowding out, an increase in government purchases will shift the aggregate demand to AD2, no crowding out. And equilibrium is at potential GDP of $17.4 trillion, point B. But the higher interest rate resulting from the increased government purchases will reduce consumption, investment, and net exports, causing aggregate demand to shift to AD2, crowding out. The result is a new short-run equilibrium at point C, with real GDP of $17.3 trillion, which is $100 billion short of potential GDP. Most economists agree that in the short run, an increase in government spending results in partial crowding out. In the long run, the decline in investment, consumption, and net exports exactly offsets the increase in government purchases, and aggregate demand remains unchanged. In early 2008, economists advising President Bush believed that the housing crisis and rising oil prices were pushing the economy into a recession. These economists proposed cutting taxes. Congress enacted a tax cut in the form of rebates that were sent to taxpayers. One-time tax rebates increase consumers' current income, but not their permanent income. Therefore, a tax rebate is likely to increase consumption less than would a permanent tax cut. Congress and President Obama intended the spending increases and tax cuts in the stimulus package to increase aggregate demand and help pull the economy out of the 2007-2009 recession. Panel A shows how the increases in spending were distributed and panel B shows how the tax cuts were distributed. Did they work? Depends on who you ask, of course. Conservatives will say unemployment is near double digits and growth is slow, so clearly it didn't work. Liberals will say, yes, unemployment is too high, but that's just a sign the stimulus wasn't big enough. It worked when you think about how much higher unemployment would have been without it. Each side can find facts and models to fit its worldview. My challenge to you is to decide how it is best interpreted, what worked, and what could have been done different. Congress and President Obama intended the spending increases and tax cuts in the stimulus package to be temporary. Panel A shows the effect of the stimulus package on federal expenditures was greatest during 2010 and declined in the following years. Panel B shows that the effect on federal government revenue was greatest during 2010 and had declined to almost zero by early 2011. The recession worsened in September 2008. Congress passed the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, ARRA, in February 2009. The ARRA was an $840 billion package of tax cuts and spending increases that was the largest fiscal policy action in U.S. history. About two-thirds of the package took the form of government expenditures, and one-third took the form of tax cuts. 
At the time the stimulus package was passed, administration economists estimated that the increase in aggregate demand resulting from the package would increase real GDP by 3.5% and increase employment by 3.5 million people by the end of 2010. In fact, between 2009 and the end of 2010, real GDP increased by 4%, while employment declined by 3.3 million. Isolating the effects of the stimulus package from other factors is difficult, which is why economists differ in their views about how effective the stimulus package was. Economists at the Congressional Budget Office, the CBO, estimated the effectiveness of the stimulus package. If these estimates are accurate, then this fiscal policy action significantly reduced the severity of the recession. However, compared to the severity of the recession, the effect of the package was relatively small and did not come close to bringing the economy back to full employment. The CBO's analysis relied on estimates of the government purchases and tax multipliers. Estimating exact numbers for multipliers is difficult because, over time, several factors can cause the aggregate demand and short-run aggregate supply curves to shift. Obama administration economists used an average of the multiplier estimates from the Federal Reserve and from a private macroeconomic forecasting firm. Some economists argued that the multiplier value was too high, while others argued that it was too low. This uncertainty indicates the difficulty economists have in arriving at a firm estimate of the effects of fiscal policy. So automatic stabilizers are provisions in law that decrease government revenues or increase government expenditures. Uh, when the economy goes into recession, and then do vice versa when the economy expands. And that's all without any additional actions taken on the part of the government, just as David said. Stabilizers tend to reduce the depth of a recession, and vice versa, tend to dampen expansions. Basically, stabilizers affect aggregate demand. So households and businesses who pay less in taxes or households who receive more in transfers, we think that those changes flow through to differences in, to changes in aggregate demand, which affect the economy. A federal deficit is the amount by which the government's total budget outlays exceed its total receipts for a fiscal year. In fiscal year 2015, the federal deficit was $438 billion. In fiscal year 2016, the federal government has estimated that the deficit was $616 billion. During wars, government spending increases far more than tax revenues, increasing the budget deficit. The budget deficit also increases during recessions, as government spending increases and tax revenues fall. A budget deficit is the situation in which the government's expenditures are greater than its tax revenue. A budget surplus is the situation in which the government expenditures are less than its tax revenue. As with other macroeconomic variables, it is useful to consider the size of the surplus or deficit relative to the size of the overall economy. From 2009 to 2011, the federal budget deficit was greater than 8% of GDP. The economic recovery from the 2007 to 2009 recession and tax increases and reductions in federal spending lowered the deficit to 4% of GDP in 2013. Most of the increase in the deficit during a typical recession takes place without the President and Congress taking any action. Deficits occur automatically during recessions for two reasons. First, during a recession, wages and profits fall, causing tax revenues to fall. Second, the government automatically increases its spending on transfer payments when the economy moves into recession. Because budget deficits automatically increase during recessions and decrease during expansions, economists often look at the cyclical adjusted budget deficit, or surplus, 
to provide a more accurate measure of the effects of the government's spending and tax policies than the actual deficit or surplus. The cyclically adjusted budget deficit or surplus is the deficit or surplus in the federal government's budget if the economy were at potential GDP. Automatic budget surpluses and deficits can help to stabilize the economy. Deployment of fiscal policies discussed in this chapter seem to make obvious, even if difficult, results for the economy. Can we assume they were unsuccessful in the Great Depression of the 1930s? We cannot really make that case because they were not even tried when the big one landed. A balanced budget is a budget where revenues equal expenditures. A balanced budget can also refer to a budget where revenues are greater than expenditures. Most economists have also agreed that a balanced budget would decrease interest rates, increase savings and investment, shrink trade deficits, and help the economy grow faster over a longer period of time. Keynesians argue for balanced budgets over the course of the business cycle. If a country rigidly pursues a balanced budget regardless of the circumstances, critics argue that economic downturns would be needlessly painful. Some post-Keynesian economists argue that deficit spending is necessary, either to create the money supply, chartalism, or to satisfy demand for saving in excess of what can be satisfied by private investment. Chartalists argue that deficit spending is logically necessary because, in their view, fiat money is created by deficit spending. Fiat money cannot be collected in taxes before it is issued and spent. The amount of fiat money in circulation is exactly the government debt money spent but not collected in taxes. In a quip, fiat money governments are spend and tax, not tax and spend. Deficit spending comes first. Cardalists argue that nations are fundamentally different from households. Governments in fiat money system which only have debt in their own currency can issue other liabilities, their fiat money, to pay off their interest-bearing bond debt. They cannot go bankrupt involuntarily because this fiat money is what is used in their economy to settle debts, while household liabilities are not so used. The federal government debt increases whenever the federal government runs a budget deficit. The large deficits incurred during World Wars I and II, the Great Depression, and the 1980s and early 1990s increased the ratio of debt to GDP. The large deficits after 2008 caused the ratio to spike up to its highest level since 1947. When the federal government runs a budget deficit, the Treasury must borrow funds from investors by selling Treasury securities. When the federal government runs a surplus, the Treasury pays off some existing bonds. The total value of U.S. Treasury bonds outstanding is referred to as the federal government debt, or the national debt. The federal government is in no danger of defaulting on its debt. The government can raise the funds it needs by taxing households and firms to pay interest on its debt. However, if the debt becomes large relative to the economy, the government may have to raise taxes to very high levels or cut back on other types of spending to make interest payments on the debt. In the long run, a debt that increases in size relative to GDP can pose a problem. Crowding out of investment spending can occur if an increasing debt drives up the interest rates. I think that fiscal policy is focusing a bit too much on the short run and not enough on the long run. Um, The near-term policies, which include not only the sequester but the tax increases and other measures, 
according to the CBO, are cutting about a percentage point and a half, about 1.5 percentage points from growth in 2013. Um, that would mean instead of 2% growth, we might be enjoying 3.5% growth. Um, at the same time, Congress has not addressed uh, a lot of long-run issues where um, sustainability remains uh, not yet achieved. Um, so yes, my, uh, my suggestion to Congress is to consider possibilities that involve somewhat less restraint uh, in the near term and uh, more action to make sure that uh, we are on a sustainable path in the long run. And I think that's broadly consistent with the IMF's uh, perspective. Some policy actions are intended to have long-run effects by expanding the productive capacity of the economy and increasing the rate of economic growth. Actions that have long-run effects are sometimes called supply-side economics. The tax wedge is the difference between the pre-tax and post-tax return to an economic activity. The tax wedge applies to the marginal tax rate, which is the fraction of each additional dollar of income that must be paid in taxes. Here's how the tax cuts affect aggregate supply. Taxes are levied both to raise revenue for the taxing authority and to penalize certain undesirable activities. In this discussion, we will talk about the former situation. Individual income tax. Reducing marginal tax rates on individual income will reduce the tax wedge faced by workers, thereby increasing the quantity of labor supplied. Cutting individual income tax rates also raises the return to entrepreneurship and the return to saving. Corporate income tax. Reducing the marginal corporate income tax rate would encourage investment spending by increasing the return corporations receive from new investments in equipment, factories, office buildings, and new technology. Taxes on dividends and capital gains. Reducing the tax rates on dividends and capital gains increases the supply of loanable funds from households to firms, increasing savings and investment, and lowering the equilibrium real interest rate. If the tax code were greatly simplified, the economic resources currently used by the tax preparation industry would be available to produce other goods and services. In addition to wasting resources, the complexity of the tax code may also distort the decisions made by households and firms. A simplified tax code could increase economic efficiency and reduce the number of decisions made by households and firms solely to reduce their tax payments. If tax reduction and simplification are effective, the economy will experience increases in labor supply, saving, investment, and the formation of new firms. Economic efficiency will also be improved. A successful policy of tax reductions and simplifications will benefit the economy by increasing output and employment and, at the same time, may result in smaller increases in the price level. The initial equilibrium is at point A. With no tax change, the long-run aggregate supply curves shift to the right, from LRAS1 to LRAS2. Equilibrium moves to point B with the price level falling from P1 to P2 and real GDP increasing from Y1 to Y2. With tax reduction and simplification, the long-run aggregate supply curve shifts further to the right, to LRAS3, and equilibrium moves to point C, with the price level falling to P3 and real GDP increasing to Y3. Most economists agree that there are supply-side effects to reducing taxes. Decreasing marginal income tax rates will increase the quantity of labor supplied. Decreasing the corporate income tax will increase investment spending and so on. The magnitude of the effects is subject to considerable debate. The size of the supply-side effects of tax policy can be determined only by careful study of the effects of differences in tax rates on labor supply and saving and investment decisions. 